business figure and thinker, author, and agent provocateur, Peter Thiel, from Fiesole, Italy, Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Peter Thiel graduated from Stanford and then from Stanford Law School. A few months after joining one of the most prestigious law firms in New York, he decided not to practice law, returned to California, and soon co-founded a tech startup. After selling that startup, PayPal, he became an investor, making the first outside investment in Facebook. Since then, he has invested in companies such as LinkedIn, Palantir, and SpaceX. Peter Thiel has also become a public intellectual. Peter, welcome. Peter, thanks for having me. Things slow down. In the last quarter century, economic growth in the United States has slowed. Real wages have remained, for the most part, stagnant. Moore's law, that computing power per dollar would effectively double 18, every 18 months, hasn't applied for years. Instead, we've got a kind of parody of Moore's law, E. Room's law, which is Moore, Moore spelled backwards, that uh, every new bio, the price of a new biotech drug doubles every seven years. And in field after field, even theoretical progress seems to have slowed. Physics in the last 50 years, nothing like the enormous creativity of the first half of the 20th century. From Einstein's general relativity in 1916 to putting a man on the moon in 1969, just over half a century, the last time we put a man on the moon, half a century ago. Peter Thiel, we were promised flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. What has happened? Well, I, th I think you just gave a very, a very good summary of what happened. That some, somehow um, we, you know, we had uh, we had this sort of multifaceted, multidimensional progress in the first half of the 20th century, where if you define technology in the late 1960s, um, it would have meant rockets and aerospace and the green revolution in agriculture, and you know, and computers and new medicines and all sorts of things. Whereas uh, today. Uh, Maybe the last quarter century, the world technology um, is synonymous with information technology, which right. is that we've had some continued progress in this world of, um, of bits, internet, computers, mobile internet. Maybe even that slowed over the last decade, or has at least become much less charismatic. Mm. Um, but uh, but there has been sort of this generalized sense of stagnation. It's always uh, it's always quite a complicated thing to talk about because you have to sort of evaluate all these different things. So. You know, how do you weight um, um, the smoothness of your iPhone versus the lack of a flying car? Right. How do you sort of how do you sort of measure and quantify all these things? Uh, I think the difficulty of quantifying it is one of the reasons that we have not talked about it enough, and that this it has taken us so long to figure out that uh, we've actually been been stuck. That <clears throat> that you know we think we've been in, in enchanted uh, a forest, but we've been wandering in the desert for. 40 or 50 years so, or something like that. So since you raise it, how do you handle the counter argument, which is, which is perfectly straightforward? Look, progress takes place in fits and starts. It's not smooth and continuous in every field. It jumps around. And we have had a communications revolution, which in, in this period of time we've gone, well, we didn't get flying cars, but we did get Dick Tracy watches. We did get iPhones. We have got an internet, which means that we here in Italy are connected. You get the picture. That's the counter argument. Well, uh, well, again, I, th I think the, the challenge is to somehow try to quantify over all these things, how, how, how big are they, how significant they are, are they. And I would say on the level of the politics, the culture, the macroeconomics, um, there is this profound sense of stagnation. There is this profound sense that the younger generation will not do, do better than their parents. There's some kind of generational compact that's, that's been broken. We still have progressivism in politics. We still have it as a word. but. Uh, it's sort of that we don't have it in anything else in our society. And, uh, and then I think even, you know, I think the computer uh, internet revolution was the one, one big exception. And it is striking how, um, how uncharismatic that has become over the last uh, six or seven years, where, uh, you know, even in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, um, the felt sense is that uh, most people are somehow being, being left behind, that it is not, it's not this utopian, inclusive future at all. Um, again, I'm quoting you. This is something you mentioned just the other day. There's a sense that science and tech are a trap that humanity is setting for itself. 
Well, there's always a question, you know, why why the slowdown has right. happened, and uh, and I, I'm always hesitant to answer the the why question because these things are so so overdetermined, and it can be things from sclerosis and overregulation in government to uh, to you know ways that education institutions have deranged. It's possible that in certain areas it's just become harder to, to discover new things. Where you know, even if we build new particle colliders in physics, how many new particles are we finding? And so, um, so there's sort of are a whole range of of, uh, of components to it. But if I had to, you know, if I had to anchor on a single narrative, the one the one that I've come to believe very strongly is that there's something about uh, science and technology that is uh, very dangerous, that that feels somewhat like a trap. Where, um, where so many of these uh, technologies um, have sort of a very dark, violent, even apocalyptic dimension. The paradigmatic example are probably nuclear weapons, where you know it didn't progress didn't stop immediately after 1945, <clears throat> but it was some kind of a delayed quarter century reaction where, say, in 1970, people woke up one day and realized, you know, we can blow the whole, whole world o up. You know, 20 times over. You know, we're sending people to the moon to build these ICBMs to send the nuclear thermonuclear bombs to the Soviet Union even faster. And at some point, what's the point? And uh, and then I think what what happened with nuclear technology is true of so many other areas. Um, you know, uh, there's a question about AI. Is this you know, is this is a fundamentally dangerous apocalyptic technology? There's a left wing version of this with climate change, but maybe you can generalize this to various other forms of environmental degradation. Uh, there is, um, you know, um, you know. I, I, polemically, I've often suggested, you know, we should have a ticker tape parade for the scientists who invented the mRNA vaccine, just so we get a, um, you know, an impressive breakthrough in biotech. And I think we're uncomfortable giving them a ticker tape parade because immediately adjacent to the mRNA vaccine is, um, we're immediately reminded as we have that ticker tape parade, or if we were to have it, of uh, the sort of gain of function research that was being conducted at the Wuhan lab. And, which is sort of this Orwellian word, maybe for uh, for a bioweapons program. And so, so all these things are are deeply so, adjacent. So the notion is that every one of these technological and scientific advances that we used to be so thrilled about, every one of them has is a double-edged sword. It at least it at least has a, it, it's at least double-edged. Now you know I, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing them. I, I'm no, still right. I'm still on the you know I'm still on the accelerationist camp. I'm still on the deregulation side. I'm still. Uh, I, I, I still think it's a catastrophe that these things have, have slowed down, but um, but it's not simply a failure. It's also you know it's also uh, it's also what uh, what people have done because you know the alternatives were, were were quite quite dangerous and quite frightening. I would like there to be all you know we've made very little progress in cancer research. I'd like there to be more progress in in biotech, but maybe if we'd had a lot of progress, there would have been some dangers with that and people. We're very, very scared of those dangers. So the you know, there's a there's a there's a nuclear power plant deb debate in Germany. You know why did they shut down the nuclear power plants? It's, it's the dumbest thing ever. But but so many of these nuclear power plants, you know, are dual use. You know, you you, you create plutonium and then you can build you can build bombs. And it's it's not that easy to separate the civilian from military uses. Right. So the idea here is. We've slowed down for all kinds of little reasons that we can see increase in regulation. This that fine. But there's a deep reason, almost at the level of the, the reptile brain, something so deep that we don't often talk about it and aren't often perhaps even conscious of it. Tech and science is frightening. So if you, if you look just at, as happy to have it slow down. If you look moment. at, uh, you know, I used to, as a, as a teenager, I used to love science fiction. I haven't read much science fiction in, in decades because it's, it's all just dystopian and depressing. Yeah. And maybe that's a... Maybe that's some reflection of, of our culture, but uh, maybe it is also telling us something about, um, about the logic of, um, of science and technology that, uh, that so many of the paths to the future are, um, are extremely dangerous. Right. You know, if you, had a, if you had a warp drive like they have in Star Trek, you know, um, could you send weapons at warp speed and then they would hit you faster than the speed of light and you, would, you wouldn't even see them before they, they hit you. And, uh, and so there are all these sort of plot holes in the original Star Trek universe that over time people figured out. Um, we'll come back to that. China. The late foreign policy analyst Henry Rowan writing in 1996, that year is important, 1996, quote, when will China become a democracy? The answer is around the year 
2015. This prediction is based on China's steady and impressive economic growth, which in turn fits the pattern of the way in which freedom has grown in Asia and elsewhere in the world, close quote. First economic growth, then democracy. Not a crazy suggestion. It worked in South Korea, and then it worked in Taiwan. But of course, the prediction that China would become a democracy in 2015 today looks preposterous. Why didn't it work in China? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's again, why questions are always, always, always hard, hard to, to answer. It's, uh, you know, the, you know, one, one cut I always have on China was that, uh, they learned from the fall of the Berlin wall in 1989 and that they were, they were going to have, um, perestroika without glasnost. They were going to have a certain liberalization of the economy without becoming a sort of a free and open society. Um, it's certainly, there certainly were a lot of indications well before 2015 that it wasn't quite trending that way. You know, you had a, you had a great firewall around China where the big U.S. internet companies didn't have any effective presence in China. 2010, 2005, 2000, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty, pretty effectively walled off. And, uh, and, you know, if you ask people in Silicon Valley circa 2005 or 2010, there was still some Fukuyama inevitability law that, you know, China would have to open up to the U.S. tech companies. It wasn't obvious why that was true, even in 2005 or, or 2010. But, yeah, but I think, um, I think, I think somehow we were, there's always a question how much of these things are personal or structural. So there's a personal version where you can say that there's something, you know, unusually crazy about Xi, that it, right. he's the second coming of Stalin or Genghis Khan or, or something like this. Um, and then there's maybe, but maybe it's, maybe it's not personal to Xi, maybe it's just structural, that, right. uh, that China could be moderately free, not completely totalitarian, as long as the economy was growing 8% a year. And at the point when that slowed down and all exponential things eventually slow, you had to actually clamp down a lot more. <clears throat> that once China grows at three or four percent a year and the growth is uneven, um, it's, it's actually going to become more authoritarian, more totalitarian, some, something like that. Let, let me try two quotations on you here. The historian Stephen Kotkin, whom you know, when asked to name his main finding after a lifetime of studying in the Soviet archives, Quote, they were communists, close quote. President Xi Jinping of China, this is, he's speaking to the Central Committee in 2013. This is a speech the Chinese republished in 2019, and that as far as I can tell from looking at the internet, American analysts discovered in 2020. Xi Jinping in 2013 to the Central Committee. There are people who believe that communism is an unattainable hope, but facts have repeatedly told us that Marx and Engels' analysis is not outdated, capitalism is bound to die out, close quote. So, in the conflict with China, to what extent are we facing just another great power struggle? But this was always the question with the Soviet Union, right? Oh, it's just another great, no, it isn't. They're different because they're communists. Same question for China. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that, that uh, we, we need to take it more seriously at face value. Right. They say they're communist, we should just take that very- Why argue with we should, we should take that at least at, at face value. Uh, there probably are a lot of sub-questions one can ask, so maybe they're not strictly Marxist, but they are strictly Leninist, and so it is sort of this totalitarian one-party structure. Uh, maybe there are elements of it that are also fascist, where, you know, the, the Prague Spring was communism with the human face, and maybe, maybe China is fascism with a, a communist face, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and then, of course, there are some, some ways in which it's, it's also different from fascism and communism in the early 20th century forms where both fascism and communism were fundamentally youth movements. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, and then China is kind of a gerontocracy. And, and so it is a, it's sort it of- It is a, distinctive. So it is it's a, I don't know, it's sort of a half fascist, half communist gerontocracy. Uh, it is, um, you know, it is, it is, it is strange, it's strangely much less idealistic or ideological, I think, than the Soviet Union. It, 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 it strikes me that people probably don't really believe in any of these ideas. They have to sort of be forced down in a, in a very strange way. So there are, there's certainly a lot of things that are unique and, and different, but, uh, but yet t taking it as a communist country at face value, we could, we could do much worse than that. All right. Grand strategy. Since at least the Civil War, 
the United States has relied on superior material, grant just ground down Lee. During the Second World War, we, we produced thousands of planes and tanks and ships. The Kaiser Shipyard in Oakland was producing a ship a day. That won't work against China. We can't outproduce them. We can't outspend them. Our only hope, goes the argument, is to out-innovate them. I've even heard the historian Andrew Roberts say that the future of civilization will be decided in Silicon Valley. So, on the one hand, in the coming conflict with China, we need innovation, goes at least one argument that I find compelling. But we ourselves, to some extent, as you just were suggesting, have locked down innovation. This is a serious pickle. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's sort of are a lot of, lot of different ways one can, one can describe it. If, if you, I worry that if you frame it simply as a conflict between the United States and China, uh, that is almost self-defeating, where um, probably you know, China has four times the population, so we have to, we would have to really out-innovate them, and they would, we have to really block them from stealing any of our innovations to, to win a conflict where it's that lopsided, four to one on, on population. Um, probably, you know, probably a big part of the question of, of the next few decades is sort of how does the strategic map of the world shape up? And, uh, you know, do, um, you know, maybe China can beat the U.S., but it probably can't be, beat the whole world. And there is sort of a question whether, whether um, there's something about, you know, um, the communism in China which is, you know, it's, it's very, it's, 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 it's nationalistic. It's, 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 it's a, it's a it socialism. Doesn't win allies. It's a socialism of a nationalistic sort. Right. And, uh, and it's extremely racist. It's extremely xenophobic. And there's something about that where uh, I don't think they'll be able to beat the whole world. Okay. So, so in the shape of the conflict, it is correct to identify China as the adversary. China is the enemy. But it's not just the United States. We have to. We, we really have no choice. We have to think in terms of the West, or in terms of as many allies as we can stitch together. What? Are, what how do you describe? There, I think they're both. You know, they're both unilateral and multilateral moves. I think the uh, Trump administration was correct that you had to try to do things unilaterally because the multilateral approaches were too slow. I think the uh, the Biden administration is correct that at some point, you know, you also have to try to do things more multilaterally. Uh, but I think there is, there is some kind of a, there is some kind of a logic to this. And, uh, you know, uh, if, if you look at the, the, um, the Ukraine conflict with Russia, uh, there's obviously was this incredible mistake that Western Europe made to entangle itself so tightly with, uh, with Russia, uh, you know, with, with the pipelines, with the denuclearization in Germany. And, uh, and then, and then the question you have to ask is, aren't we, aren't we just too entangled with China in the entire Western world? I, I believe in free trade. I, I'm not in favor of tariffs, but uh, I, I would make an exception for, you know, our one massive geopolitical and ideological rival. All right. Um, our home state, California. Your home state, your native state, my home state now. The resource curse. I'm just going to quote from Wikipedia. Here's the resource curse. The resource curse is the phenomenon of countries with an abundance of natural resources, such as fossil fuels, having less economic growth, less democracy, or worse development outcomes than countries with fewer resources. Close quote. You spoke recently at the National Conservatism Conference in Miami, I think, about the resource curse in California. Explain that. Well, if we if we say that uh, tech is the oil of the of the 21st century, um, there is this strange juxtaposition where California has been, you know, it has these gusher-like companies that just generate, you know, enormous wealth, enormous profits, you know, a decent number of quite well-paying jobs, and then they're combined with this, um, you know, rather bad form of social political governance. Uh, where you'd, you'd never do anything anything like this, and it's it's that juxtaposition I was I was I was trying to make sense of. And there's like a San Francisco version of it where it's you know on a per capita GDP it has to be one of the wealthiest cities in the world, and then it's it's completely misgoverned. And somehow 
these things are, <laughs> it's not a paradox, but these, these things are actually deeply, deeply connected. So you, you made the point. But I would, I would the, yeah, the one thing I would quibble with on the definition is um, California is not poor. It's, it's, it's still, Fantastic. it's, it's, in, it's in, you know, it's 40 million people in California. It's 82 million in Germany, 125 million in Japan. Today, the California GDP is roughly the same as Germany or Japan. The average person in California makes twice as much money as the average person in Germany, three times as much as the average person in Japan. So there's something about it that's, that's worked quite well from a macroeconomic point of view, and then it's worked catastrophically from a governance point of view, right? public schools that don't work, you know, um, you know, all these sort of government worker rackets. You, you mentioned two, sort of you mentioned a couple of, I mean, it's worked quite well. It's worked historically well. There's never been any cr massive creation of wealth over for so much wealth in so short a time, as far as I go. Well, if, if we evaluate it by GDP, it's still working quite well. Yes. If we evaluate it by the quality of government, you know, it's, right. it's, it's quite screwed up. I, the, the, you know, the, the resource curse analogy I used is, you know, if we compare it to oil countries, it's not the worst, it's not the best, it's not as good as Norway, it's not as bad as Equatorial Guinea, uh, I think you should think of it as roughly on par with Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi Arabia has a crazy, crazy Wahhabi ideology. California has uh, a woke ideology. Wahhabism to Saudi Arabia is roughly like uh, wokeism to California. You mentioned that one aspect of the misgovernance is inflated real estate values. Explain how that works. You have to think of it as, uh, you have to think of uh, the curse of an oil state or a tech state as uh, you, you have this enormous gusher of wealth and then it gets redistributed very inefficiently. And, and one inefficient vehicle is towards overpaid government workers. The average California government worker gets paid twice as much as the average private sector worker in California. It's by far the highest ratio in the US. I mean, Texas, Florida, the average government worker gets paid 10, 15% more than the average private sector worker in California. It's twice as much, including, you know, including the very generous uh, the retirement pensions, benefits right, they get. Right. And then the second way um, that the tech wealth gets very inefficiently redistributed is through all these sort of crazy zoning laws where, you know, if, if you're living in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, you're not in the tech industry, but, you know, you're a landlord who bought some apartment and you make sure the zoning laws never get changed, nothing new ever gets built, and, you know, enormous amount gets, uh, gets uh, shifted into, into the sort of, you know, very uh, quasi-governmental real estate sector. Overall, the cost of living in California is some 40% higher than in the rest of the nation, and the cost of real estate is 100% higher. What does that mean? Once again, I'm quoting you. Basically, you have to replace the middle class, meaning they just move out. Sure, sure. There was, I, I believe it was Carol Quigley, the Georgetown historian, who uh, circa 1960 said that the, you know, the Republicans are the party of the middle class, the Democrats are the party of everybody else. and. Um, and probably the most middle class constituency left in California are government workers. And uh, if you think of teachers or people like that as not natural Republican voters, um, if that's the, you know, the microeconomic, the political economy of California is something like that, it's no wonder that it's a D plus 30 state. It's not, it, I mean, it shouldn't be surprising at all. Right. Um, so this brings us to politics. Y you argue that the Golden State poses a problem for each of the two parties, Democrats and Republicans. Democrats first, quoting you. On the Democratic side, my read is that they have all no, they, the Democrats, have no alternative but to somehow pretend they can make the California model work for the country as a whole, but it won't. It's just like, you know, if you, if you were to say, it's, I don't know, I'll go back to the Saudi Arabia analogy. If you were to say just, the Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia me, is, is, the, is the key to solving all the problems throughout the Islamic world, they just need to be like Saudi Arabia. That's preposterous mm. because it's not the Wahhabi ideology, it's the oil money. Right. And in a similar way, if, you know, if, California, if, it, if, it's, if it's somebody like, I don't know, Newsom or Kamala Harris saying that it's some you know, hyper woke identity politics, political correctness to the nth degree, that's not what makes California successful. It's the, it's the big tech companies. They're at the scale that they're at. You know, you can't scale them by a factor of eight to the country as a whole. So it, it doesn't scale. Uh, the leading Democratic presidential candidates I'm predicted as we speak. You've got Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Gavin Newsom, quoting Peter Thiel, California is strong enough to crush everybody else in the Democratic Party. You're assuming that Joe Biden won't run, mm -hmm. right? California is strong enough to crush everybody else in the Democratic Party, which means you've got two Californians on top, Kamala Harris and Gavin Newsom, but it's probably not strong enough to be a very compelling agenda for the country as a whole. 
Yeah, you've just articulated my whole argument. I don't have much, don't have much to add to that, but I, I think, yes. Hold on, I, I, but let's I, I stop think, that. Well, well, I think the alternatives to California, if we were to enumerate them, it is, it is something like, um, okay, it is um, Elizabeth Warren, you know, the university, the crazed university professor who is like, you know, is like a bad Puritan minister from the 17th century. That's not going to work. It is, um, you know, it's Tim Ryan, the, fla the fake blue collar guy from Ohio where, where no one cares about blue collar workers. So the, there's a Midwestern thing that's not going to work. There's probably, you know, some kind of crazed socialist thing a la Bernie Sanders or AOC. That's dead on arrival. And, uh, and so, yes, there's somehow, there's some sense in which California is, is working the best and so it will beat everything within the Democratic Party. And then my speculative predictions, when you, when you get to the country as a whole, it will be found shockingly wanting. Probably, I'm quoting you once again, probably the temptation on the Republican side is that they'll think it's good enough to say simply that they're not California. This nihilistic negation is probably not enough. Well, let's qualify that again. And this is speculating on 2024 right. politics, which is which quite far fun. in the future. It's, it's so far. It's so future, far in the future. It's, it's so far in the future. But uh, but I think uh, I think it is it is probably if it's not enough for the Democrats, it is probably enough for the Republicans to win um, the elect the presidential election in 2024. I would like them to do more. I would like them to um, to win on substantive grounds where you don't just have a you know a tactical win. You don't just have another one-term president. Um, but uh, but I can understand that the temptation is not even to try that, to just go with, you know, we're not going to allow this Californication of the rest of the country to happen. And uh, maybe that's enough. But I, I, I would like more, but I'm, I'm not even completely questioning the, the, okay. the, the tactical judgment. So let, let, let's talk for a second, if we could, about what that more should be. Here, when I was in college, let me take you, let me take you on a little travel log here. When I was in college, we were worried about getting jobs, and there were bull sessions in the dorm rooms about the Soviet Union, about how Vietnam went wrong, and so forth. Ronald Reagan gets along and gets elected in 1980, and both problems get solved. An economic expansion begins, and it takes place, takes, continues for, with a few setbacks, but it fundamentally continues for 25 years. And we win the Cold War. And so for my generation, there's a I think a perfectly understandable impulse to say, wait a minute, why don't we try that again? But in the younger generation, Ross Dowdett has this phrase that he keeps using, zombie Reaganism. So I hear that and I say, of course, principles have to be adapted to the issues of the day, but is there an extent to which the rising generation on the right and center right is just sick of hearing about Ronald Reagan, the way Democrats in the 60s got sick of hearing about FDR. Is it purely generational? Or is there some sense in which tax cuts, lower regulation, stronger defenses somehow w are ill-fitted to the circumstances of the day? Well, I, I, th I think I, I would like to get back to growth. Um, and I would like to get back to growth that is you know, not um, inflationary, that's not cancerous, uh, and that's not uh, you know, apocalyptic in the sort of bad tech version and this is this is much easier said than done but that's that's what I think you know we should figure out how to do how to do this in a, in a detailed way and there certainly is there probably are some tax cuts that are part of it there's a lot of de deregulation that's that's part of it um, and it is a it's a fairly hard thing to do there's um, you know there certainly are ways that I would like us to take the uh, the challenge of China more seriously uh, but it's it's not like this, this super simple thing. You know, there, was, there was a way that the Soviet Union was motivational in a way that China was not, because the Soviet Union, even in the darkest hours, the Cold War, 79, Carter Malays, um, most of us thought we were eventually going to beat the Soviet Union. And uh, the China piece, it's, 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 it's harder to see how to do that. It's, it's not entirely up, up to us. Part of it you know, uh, depends on other countries working with us, part of it. Part of it uh, will be helped by you know, China just uh, going completely berserk internally, um, and uh, and so I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that, that the exact same formula will work. Okay, so we do first what we know how to do. But look, look, I'm I'm, I'm quite open. I don't I don't know I don't know exactly. 
what you're supposed to do in terms of having a more, there goes more a concrete whole agenda. I thought you were going th no, to. I have a blank think, page here where you were going to fill I, it I in. Think, I think you know. I think we have to look. I think you know. I always I always think the uh, you know the, uh, the, the 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 right broadly is uh, it's a very ragtag rebel alliance. It's like uh, it's like we have diversity on our side. It is like it's like Star Wars. It's Chewbacca and Princess Leia, and we have you know some Asperger like C three PO people. The Rebel Alliance and Han Solo. It's the whole. It's the Rebel Alliance, and you know the other side is in lockstep. They're the Imperial stormtroopers, and uh, there are a lot of disadvantages to the Rebel Alliance. But uh, one one advantage is we, yeah, we don't have we don't have to have all the answers right now. We can admit we haven't figured it out, and we're gonna we're gonna have a vigorous debate in the next few years to figure it out. We're talking a couple of weeks before the election. This will air a day or two after the election. May I ask, you, you supported your friends, Blake Masters, now running for the Senate in Arizona. By the time this airs, we'll know the outcome. And J.D. Vance, now running for the Senate from Ohio. By the time this airs, we'll know. Why those two? Is there, uh, you know them, they're friends. That's one element, I'm, of, of, I assume. But was there something distinctive about, do, do they look to you like the future in some specific way of, that the Republican Party ought to pursue? Sure, there's a generational component. They would be the first, they would be the first uh, uh, millennial Republican senators. There's a, there's a way in which they've thought very deeply about these issues. Uh, there's a way in which I think they're not excessively dogmatic. You know, I, I, often, I often think that we have, you know, Often say, like to say, we have two parties in this country. There's the evil party, the Democrats, and the stupid party, the Republicans. And I, I like both uh, um, J.D. Vance and Blake Masters because they don't squarely fit into either of those two parties. All right. A couple of quotations here, just to pursue that. What what is to be done, and take it up to a, one, maybe a higher notch or two, one or one or two conceptual notches up. Two quotations. Notre Dame political scientist Patrick Deneen. Quote, liberalism has failed. He's speaking here of classical liberalism, the liberalism of individual liberty. Liberalism has failed, not because it fell short, but because it was true to itself. It has failed because it has succeeded. The founders failed to foresee that their atomistic philosophy would act as a solvent on our civic institutions. That's quotation one. Here's quotation two. Author George Will. The proper question for conservatives, what do you seek to conserve? The proper answer, we seek to conserve the American founding. George Will, let's get back to the founding principles. Patrick Deneen, let's refound the country. Let's overturn the original founding. Uh, they both strike me as too, um, a little bit too abstract. You know, there's, there's things about them that sound correct as observations or critiques, but um, how to concretize it, I, I don't know how we go back to the founding. If there's going to be a new founding, that's even more you know, ambitious. You and like you, the, you, the majority of six conservatives on, or originalists on the Supreme Court? Um, sure, but mostly they're just, they're mostly just keeping things, the status quo the way it is. So, so it's, uh, yeah, it's better than the alternative. Um, look, look, Deneen is, is right that in some sense, classical liberalism has failed. I, I always like to say that a classical liberal in 2022 is like a Marxist prof in 1982, where you had these profs who 40 years ago were saying, you know, true communism has never been tried. And uh, it's equally wrong when the classical liberals in 2022 say that true liberalism has never been tried and there's some, some kind of a um, golden age we can go back to. And even, even if we did, wouldn't we just cycle and repeat it would, and it would just, you know, if we went back to the 50s, we'd get 68 again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so there was something wrong in the 50s or there was something wrong with the founding if it, if it, went, if it went this wrong. So that's, that's why I'm more on the Deneen side than the George Will side. Um, I, I do think, uh, you know, the, the, the place I always come back to is I, I think we have to think very hard about these questions of technology and science um, because they are such, such, such big, big drivers of modernity. I don't think we can turn our back on them, we have, but we have to figure out some way uh, to keep going on this trajectory um, and, and not to go crazy, not to atomize the whole society, not, not to self-destruct it. But I don't, I don't think you can go back on science and technology. But that's the, that's the, uh, those are the sets of questions I would, I would ask a lot more about and where I, I suspect both Deneen and, and Will are, are weak on the details.
Okay. Um, February 1946, diplomat George Cannon, then stationed in Moscow, sends a telegram of some 5,000 words to the State Department, known in history ever since as the Long Telegram. There we are, just after the end of the Second World War, just at the very inception of the Cold War, and Cannon gets everything in those 5,000 words. The nature of the Soviet Union, where it's strong, where it's weak, and then he lays out the policy of containment that remains the fundamental American policy. Some presidents are truer to it, others attempt to depart from it, but it remains the fundamental policy for all four and a half decades of the Cold War. Why hasn't there been a long telegram about China? Uh, man, what, why questions are we so hard to answer? Uh, but, but I, when I, will there be a long telegram about China? I will, I will speculate that if it hasn't, if we haven't gotten the memo, it's been lost, or it's it's not going to be c coming anytime soon. Uh, and my my theory on why there hasn't been one and there there won't be one is that um, is that people don't have a good, great long term strategy for the U.S. of how do you you know, how do you accelerate things? How do you overtake China? They don't know how to fill out the details. You know, maybe, maybe setting China aside, maybe, maybe, you know, a correct broad strategy for the U.S. is, um, is to have a gradual, you know, withdrawal from, from the world. And, uh, and you could never articulate that if that's the correct strategy because the retreat becomes a rout. And so, if the correct strategy is for the U.S. not to be overextended, overcommitted to the sort of uh, world empire that we're, we're committed to, um, articulating, you can't actually articulate that ever. Hard to pursue a policy when you can't talk about it to each other. And then if you can't talk about it, that's, that's maybe even worse. So it's, uh, but I, 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 th I think there's, I, I think my, my, my placeholder is that uh, there's something about the the best policy, um, that if it's articulated, the articulation itself will stop us from, from executing it properly. And may, maybe there's some way to, to contain China and, um, and, and probably um, you know, we're, we're best just figuring out a way to do it without articulating it. All right. Um, I heard you the other day you said that we now find ourselves between Scylla and Charybdis. Narrow, Greek mythology, narrow, straight. Scylla is a six-headed monster over here, and Charybdis is the whirlpool over here. And the Greek, in Greek myth, you had to navigate between these two, each of which was deadly. You described our Scylla and Charybdis. Actually, and you, here's what you said in a recent paper that you wrote. The stable deterrence structures of the Cold War look much shakier as more countries acquire nuclear weapons. It seems far easier now than at any time since World War II to sleepwalk into an all-out conflict. So the prospect of Armageddon, let's call that Scylla. And here's Charybdis, an endless stagnation, and quoted from the same paper, we have grown attached to our soft, comfortable ways, but we do not want to name what they are protecting against. How bad, of course what I have in mind is the war in Ukraine, how bad is the, pro is the Scylla, the prospect of Armageddon? Um, well, the, the thing that I want to say that's always nuanced and complicated is that it's, it's, it's quite bad, but uh, we have to also weight it against the alternative. And yes. the extreme alternative is, is the sort of soft totalitarianism, a, a society that's con that simply is locked down where nothing happens, um, you know, if you were to use the, you know, the, um, you know, the, 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 the biblical terminology, it's, it's the Antichrist, the one world totalitarian state. And, um, and there's always a sense where I think we should be at least as scared of the Antichrist as of, as of Armageddon. And, uh, Elaborate and, 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 then, and then certainly my, my contrarian intuition is that people are far more worried about Armageddon than they are worried about the one world state. And uh, I, would, I would at least like us to worry about them equally, to worry both about Scylla and Charybdis. Okay, so 
elaborate a little bit? Well, well, I, I can, there are all these different versions. Of it. There's, right. You know, there's a recent paper by the, by the, Ar the, uh, just the Armageddon. We sort of talked about at the opening. Well, the, the way, Armageddon is we pursue science and we pursue technology, and it could all blow up in a nuclear and then, war. And then let's yeah, let's let's right. elaborate on this. So, yes. So if you if you don't pursue if, if if we're going to stop that, you can't just stop it locally. You have to stop it globally. You have to make sure that all scientists stop it. You have to make sure that they're being policed all over the world. And if there's some small piece of computer code that can lead to a runaway AGI, we need to have surveillance technology installed on every single laptop to make sure that people aren't typing in keystrokes to code up the AGI that's going to destroy the world. Or if you can, you know, um, you know the nuclear weapons issue already from the 50s and 60s, what came with you know, this multinational at atomic energy agency that was going to, international at atomic energy agency that was going to sort of monitor um, all these countries. And you needed a supranational uh, structure with real teeth. And uh, you know, in practice, we ended up with something in between. We ended up with you know, some kind of global super state. It wasn't never quite that much. It was not, maybe not quite enough to fully stop Armageddon. It was never quite enough to be totalitarian. But those have been, those have been the, uh, the bad alternatives for, for 77 years, and uh, we need to find some way in between. Okay, and the lockdown, yeah, we fear Armageddon too much. We, we only too. talk about, yeah, we, it, it strikes me, we almost only talk about the Armageddon stuff, and we, we, we never talk about the, uh, the, um, the, the sort of regulatory political uh, lockdown that's, that's the, uh, the practical alternative where everyone's, yeah, everyone's just scared of their own shadow. So if we put it, I'm, try, I'm trying to bring growth back into this. Growth, to pursue growth, means in one way or another to have the courage to risk a certain degree of new innovation. We, uh, we unleash technology and science again to produce growth, correct? Yes. All right. So, and it, why do we, you and I, uh, because we, have known each other a long time and think alike in some pretty basic ways. We both say growth and assume that that's a good. But, but let's make that explicit. Why do we need growth? What does that do for American society? And what, why is the American what happens, or the other way around, what happens to us in the absence of growth? Well, um, we had, you know, the Club, the Club of Rome uh, wrote this book called The Limits to Growth, 1972, 72. almost exactly 50 years ago. And, um, and it basically said that you know, um, the growth couldn't continue, and so we had to get used to a zero growth world. First a world of zero population growth, then a world of zero economic growth. And, um, and there are all these ways that their agenda broadly has been implemented over, over the last 50 years. And, um, and, you know, it has in some ways perhaps stabilized the world, but it's also been profoundly destabilizing um, to you know, it's, it's led to a world that's extremely nihilistic. Um, it's, it's led to the sort of cultural disintegration of the middle class, where you think of the middle class as the people who think their, their children will do better than themselves. Um, and, and there's sort of all these ways um, the zero growth world hasn't worked out that well. And, uh, and so, yes, yeah, so my, and my intuition is that it's not simply stable. This is where I disagree with the doubt that it's not simply decadent or simply stable. Um, it's not simply entropic. It's, it's, it's ultimately, you know, there's ultimately a catastrophe on both sides. So, and there's a, we don't, yeah, there's, a, there's an Armageddon catastrophe if you have unconstrained tech and science that where no one's paying attention and people are just pushing buttons and seeing what happens. But there's also um, always a risk of a centralizing totalitarian catastrophe on the other, on the other side. Which is, uh, which is the natural solution on how do, you, you know, how do you stop all science and tech is you need a one world state with real teeth. Which is within our grasp, the humanity's grasp, so as AI emerges. Well, it's, 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 it's already, it's an answer to the nuclear problem, it's an answer to the environmental challenges, it's an answer to the AI challenges, and I would, I would just submit it's, it's not a good answer. All right, so can, sticking with growth just for one more moment, if we were to close our, if I were to close my eyes and just listen to listen to the dulcet tones of Peter Thiel, a Republican pro-growth president gets elected in 2024. What's different? What's different about a growing? What's different about the temper or mood of the country? Could we hope that economic growth would soothe the bitterness of our politics? Is that what happens? 
Sure, it would, it would, I, I, think, I think if you had growth that was non-inflationary, non-cancerous, non-apocalyptic, it would solve all our problems. And it would, now, you know, I, I don't know how realistic it is or how easy it is to get there, but, but certainly, um, you know, the extreme sort of Malthusian zero-sumness of, of the stagnation, extreme evaporate. polarization, I'm not sure it would fully evaporate, but, uh, you know, it would be, it would be lessened significantly. And, and without growth, I, I, I'm certainly very convinced of the negative version of this, where without growth, you're not going to solve the polarization, you're not going to so solve the nihilism, the anger, any of those things at all. Okay. Last question, although it'll take me a moment to set it up. Franklin Roosevelt, we have a rendezvous with destiny. John Kennedy, we will bear any burden, oppose any foe. Again and again and again in American history, we have found ourselves required to display courage as, an, as citizens and as a nation. Because there really has, the choice has been be courageous or lose. All right. George Kennan, this is 1953 at the outset of the Cold War. I mentioned Kennan a moment ago as the author of The Long Telegram. This is from a book he wrote early, early in the Cold War, 1953. The thoughtful observer of Russian-American relations will find no cause for complaint in the Kremlin's challenge. He will rather experience a certain gratitude to providence, which has made our entire security as a nation dependent on our pulling ourselves together and accepting the responsibilities of moral and political leadership that history plainly intended us to bear. Well, what do you think? Can there be in this, if this is the moment in which we find ourselves, there's Armageddon and there's stagnation and creeping world government. And we have, they're there. We have no choice but, but, but to be courageous. Can there be something ennobling about this? Can we pull ourselves together again? Well, it's... Can um, we feel adventurous? Well, it is, uh, it is, um, Certainly something like this frame is correct. Uh, it matters what we do. It's, 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 it's a world in which, yeah, we need courage. We need, um, we need some kind of agency. The choices we make really matter. You know, it's, you know, I, I, I don't think, you know, yes, Armageddon and the, the world government are exclu exclusionary possibilities. They're not exhaustive. I do, I do think there's some, you know, some narrow or, you know, not terribly broad, Way in between, but it's but it's a way. but there's a way, and uh, and uh, there's there's a lot for us to do there. It matters what we do. Uh, yeah, obviously it matters a lot. Peter Thiel, thank you for uncommon knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation. I'm Peter Robinson. <laughs>